Chapter 12, problems 1 through 3, 7, and 11. These problems pertain to the ANOVA test, analysis of variance. Number 1, explain why the F ratio is expected to be near 1 when the null hypothesis is true. In a previous um, video, I explained that our new statistic will equal 1 when we compute F and F is the ratio of variance between treatments over the variance within treatments. And that's the same as saying the variance between treatments is attributed to two different factors. One, treatment effect, and the second, unsystematic differences. And we can um, think back to the example of, of golfing. Um, if one wants to improve their golf skills, we may teach them visualization or relaxation or have them go into a no treatment condition. We would understand that the individuals within the group, um, if they're different from each other, that they bring different characteristics or um, skills to the table. For instance, their coordination skills, their cognition skills, and perhaps maybe knowledge of the game. So all of those things vary within the group. Um, and all of those things are referred to as random unsystematic differences. So if we do not see a treatment um, effect, so if there's no treatment effect, then the numerator and the denominator in this um, fraction of the F statistic would measure or represent the same variability. So in other words, if we have no treatment effect, again, the numerator represents vari variance between the treatments, and that includes the treatment effects as well as random unsystematic differences. Again, the things that individuals bring to the table to the research with them, um, things that we cannot necessarily control. And so if there are no treatment effects, then the numerator and the denominator represent the same source of variability, those individual characteristics that the participants brought with them. And so if those are representing the same source of variability, then the equation um, would represent the numerator equal to the denominator. And if that's the case, then our F ratio would equal or be close to 1. So again, we, we may see when we um, collect this information slight variations of um, those characteristics that individuals bring with them, but essentially we're saying that the value, the number, let's just say it's equal to 10 over 10 and that would equal 1.0. So the variability is coming from the same source. The numeric representation of that variability would be equal or very close to being equal, and therefore the um, ratio would be close to 1 or equal to 1. Again, understanding it as a fraction, if we take the numerator and if it's equal to the denominator, then those values are the same, and our ratio um, from one to the other would also equal 1.0. Number two, several factors influence the size of the F ratio. For each of the following, indicate whether it influences the numerator or the denominator of the F ratio, and indicate whether the size of the F ratio would increase or decrease. In each case, assume that all other factors are held constant. A, an increase in the difference between sample means. The sample means is represented by the 
systematic differences, the treatment effect, and random unsystematic differences. So again, we want to measure the mean difference between these levels, conditions, um, or treatments of the independent or quasi-independent variable. So an increase in the difference between sample means will result in a difference in the numerator because again that is um, what is measured in the numerator, the systematic treatment effects in addition to the random unsystematic differences. And therefore if we have an increase, an increase in the differences between sample means will increase the F statistic And obviously, as we, we've learned in the t-test, the numerator represents the mean difference, and um, the larger the t-value, the, the higher the likelihood of rejecting the null. Similarly here, the numerator represents the mean difference, but also the variation um, accounted for by individual differences within the samples. So if we have an increase in the numerator, then our F statistic will increase, and the likelihood of rejecting the null will also increase. B says an increase in the size of sample variance. So that is represented um, by the random unsystematic differences. Now it does have an effect on the numerator, but slightly so. Um, it has a greater impact on the random unsystematic differences because the de denominator is only measuring the variability of the samples um, or the variation within the samples. Therefore, an increase in the size of the sample variances will increase the denominator and produce a lower F statistic. So again, if the variation within the samples increases, that's going to increase the denominator. If we're dividing by a larger number, then our F statistic will decrease. In the first case, we have a larger numerator, all else being held constant. Then if the numerator is larger and we divide by the random unsystematic differences, which would be a smaller number, it would produce a higher F ratio. So in B, we would conclude that the likelihood of rejecting the null decreases because we have greater variation in the samples, um, which represents the random unsystematic differences. Number three, why should you use ANOVA instead of several t-tests to evaluate mean differences when an experiment consists of three or more treatment conditions? First of all, um, a t-test can only compare two levels or conditions per test. So if we have um, those who receive the drug versus those who don't, then a t-test would be appropriate. Um, but if we have a test where we're comparing the effects of different milligrams of that particular drug, let's say one group gets 25 milligrams, the other one gets 100 milligrams, and the third condition is the placebo group and gets zero um, milligrams of the drug, we would not be able to use a t-test, this is one single t-test, we would have to have multiple tests. And every time you conduct a test for significance, 
you have a risk of committing a type 1 error. So first, let me just um, clarify that ANOVA and Analysis of Variance Test enables one to test three or more conditions levels simultaneously. And that's advantageous because um, we would, again, as stated before, a t-test would require um, separate tests for the three conditions or levels. And with each test, we would have a, a, an alpha level set that determines the risk of a type 1 error. Type 1, again, is rejecting the null when there really isn't a treatment effect. And so every time we conduct a t-test, we have a different alpha level. And so doing separate tests increases the probability of um, engaging in type 1. When we conduct an ANOVA, it's all of those conditions are combined um, and tested simultaneously, so we have one set alpha. So again, with um, separate t-test, each test involves a risk of a type 1 error. Again, we learned that that's set by alpha, set by alpha. So therefore, the more tests you conduct, the higher risk let me just change that the higher the risk of committing a type 1 error. And we've learned that um, the consequences of type 1 are, are quite severe in comparison to type 2. Again, just to review, type 1 indicates that we've rejected the null in error. And so if we are increasing that risk, uh, we can see the effects, um, the consequences of that if we do multiple t-tests. Again, the ANOVA conducts all the tests simultaneously with one single alpha level which reduces the risk of committing a type 1 So again, we can compare um, three different conditions, levels, four, five, six, all within one test with one set alpha level. 
0 0.05, 0 0.01, whatever it may be. If we were to do separate t-tests, each t-test would have its independent alpha level and risk of type 1 error. And with each test, we increase that level of, um, of we re increase the risk of committing a type 1 because each test has its independent alpha level. So ANOVA is beneficial in the sense that everything is tested all at once with one single alpha, and that represents the percentage of likelihood of engaging in type 1 error. Number seven, use an ANOVA with alpha set at 0 0.05 to determine whether there are significant different differences among the three treatment means. So and let's begin with our null. The null states that population one will equal population two, and that will equal population three, that we will see no differences in these three treatment conditions. Again, remember that each sample represents a population. So the null says all of those treatments will have equal means and no differences amongst the three. The research hypothesis says at least one level or treatment is significantly different. So one of those population means will not equal the others. Um, and to determine this, we're going to conduct an F test and calculate an F ratio statistic. And that's equal to the mean squares between, which is the variance explained by the treatment in addition to random unsystematic differences, over the mean squares within which represents the random unsystematic differences only. So our MS between is equal to SS between over its corresponding degrees of freedom, DF between, and our MS within Similarly, it's, it's SS, sum of square deviations for the within variance over degrees of freedom within. Now, the equations for calculating MS between, or SS between to be more precise, are a little more uh, complex or challenging. So we can use the relationship between these variables to solve for that, and I'll show you in this particular example. Sometimes we don't have a choice and we must use the equation for SS between, which I'll demonstrate in the next example. So in that case, let's begin with MS within by calculating SS within. It's the easiest calculation of all the sum of squared deviations. So SS within, according to what we've learned in previous video, is simply the sum of SS, sum of square deviations, across all treatment conditions. So essentially, it's just the sum of these values. So it would be the sum of 8 plus 12 plus 16. So if we take the summation of our SS values for the independent um, samples, we should get that equal to 36. Again, that's the easiest calculation if, again, you have SS, but we already know how to calculate. If we hadn't um, been given those values, we would know how to calculate SS for each sample. We've, we've been doing that since Chapter 4 using the computational formula. Um, next, DF within, need its corresponding degrees of freedom. DF within is calculated by taking N minus K, where N is the sum of all of our um, sample values. So in other words, it, you can think of it as the population of the study. How many observations or individuals are we working with? Condition 1 has 4, condition 2 has 4, and condition 3 has 4. So it's the total of those um, observations. 
and that's equal to 12, so that's given. K, we've discussed this in a previous example or video, I should say. K represents the number of levels or treatment conditions. In this case, we have three. So 12 minus three gives us nine. And now we have um, our SS within and degrees of freedom within, which will enable us to calculate our MS within, which we'll do in just a second. The next um, calculation I'd like to do is SS total. Again, because um, these values are related to one another, on the next page you'll see how calculating SS total will enable us to calculate SS between without using the equations for SS between. So SS total from a previous um, video and from our reading, we know that the equation is sum of x squared, and that's for the total um, number of observations, minus g squared over n. So luckily this value has been given for us, or to us, the sum of x squared, and that's pertaining to all of these observations. So in the first condition we have observation 3, 5, 3, 1. Those have been squared across all three conditions and then the sum of those values has been provided. So that's 236. G, again, G is the sum of all our x values across all conditions. So T, just to review, um, is the sum of x values for condition 1. And the next T is the sum of our x values for the second condition. And the last t equal to 20 is the sum of our last or third condition. So g is simply the sum of all our t values or sum of x across all conditions. And that's equal to 48. We're going to square this. And then that's all over n, which is also given, and it's the total number of observations across conditions. So we have 236 minus 48 squared divided by 12. So again, 48 squared divided by 12 subtracted from 236 in our calculators. We get a value equal to 44. And again, that's SS total. As we can see, it's not part of either of these equations, but it will give us what we need to calculate SS between, which I'll show you in just a minute. The next thing we need to calculate is DF total, and that's equal to N minus 1, or N is equal to 12 minus 1, and that gives us 11. So what I'm going to do is take all these values and transfer them into an ENOVA table, a source table, so we can see how they're related to one another and, and then also enable us to calculate the SS between values. Okay, so what we have here is a typical ANOVA source table or output um, data information. And let's fill in what we just calculated on the previous page. So we know that SS total, that was the last calculation we completed, was equal to 44. The degrees of freedom total was equal to 11. Our SS within was equal to 36. And our degrees of freedom for the within was equal to 9. And now we can calculate SS between without actually using the equation for SS between. It, it's just um, time saving. It's a more efficient way of calculating SS between, but again, sometimes we may not have the option and it, it's um, not as efficient. But in this case, we can understand that SS between is equal to SS total minus SS within. So if we work downward, um, SS between added to SS within gives us our SS total. So if we're missing one, then obviously we can take the total and subtract the one we have to get the one that's missing. In this case, it would be SS between. So in this case, it would be 44 minus 36, and that's equal to, in our calculator, 44 minus 36 is equal to 8. So now we have our SS between without doing a lot of 
calculations. And similarly, SS, oops, excuse me, um, DF between would equal our DF total minus our DF within. And those values we calculated, so it would be 11 minus 9 is equal to 2. So now we have our degrees of freedom for the between. Again, this is just a much easier um, process of calculating SS between without using the given equations. And now we can calculate each MS, um, mean squares, for between and within. So MS between is equal to SS between over its corresponding degrees of freedom. And we have those values now. So again, we're calculating our MS values. So it's our SS divided by its... I inadvertently stopped the video and I'm not quite sure where it stopped. So I'm going to just uh, apologize if this is um, redundant, if I've already gone over this. But calculating our F is simply taking our mean squares from the between over the mean squares within. Again, the numerator represents the treatment effect in addition to unsystematic variances. And the denominator represents the random unsystematic differences within the samples. So we have the values necessary to calculate this. Again, it's MS between was equal to 4, MS within was equal to 4, and we get a ratio 1.0. And that tells us that the differences that we see between groups is no different than the differences we see within groups. So therefore, there are no treatment effects, and we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. And um, before we get to that point, we had to calculate, and I may have already done this, and if so, I apologize, MS between was equal to SS between over its corresponding degrees of freedom. And that's equal to 8 over 2, and that's where we got the 4. MS within is equal to SS within over its corresponding degrees of freedom. And that was equal to 36 over 9, and that was equal to 4. And that's these values, right, is of what we have to calculate our F ratio. Again, I apologize if I already said this, um, but because the values are the same, we see a ratio 1.0, meaning that the numerator is no different than the denominator. No treatment effects are visible here. And we would um, express this F ratio. We would include the corresponding degrees of freedom. So we would say F, our degrees of freedom for the numerator is equal to 2, comma, the degrees of freedom for the denominator, which is equal to 9, and we would say that's equal to 1. Originally, we were asked to perform a test at alpha equal 0.05. So even though we know we're going to fail to reject the, the null hypothesis because our F ratio is equal to 1, let's still find what our critical F value is equal to. We're going to use the numerator degrees of freedom and the denominator degrees of freedom to find this particular value. So again, our numerator degrees of freedom was equal to 2, and our denominator degrees of freedom was equal to 9. So the numerator, we would enter it here with 2, and then the denominator was equal to 9. Now, it's important to point out here, there's a previous video that talks about this, but here, the light type face is 0 0.05 level of significance, or alpha of 5%, and the bold face type is in reference to alpha equal to 0 0.01, or 1% alpha. So we're going to go with the light type face, um, and, whoops, wrong Wrong one, here it is. So our critical F is equal to 4.26. So from our table, we found that our critical F is equal to 4.26. So our F distribution is always positively skewed. And um, we have our F statistic, F was equal to 
1.00, and our critical F was equal to 4.26. Again, this is representing the critical region. We're um, very far from it, and again, the, the ratio equal to 1.00, seeing that we have no treatment effects. The numerator and the denominator equal. The numerator represents treatment effects plus unsystematic differences, and the denominator represents um, random unsystematic differences. So again, we know we're going to fail to reject. Because our F statistic does not fall in the critical region. And uh, even though that's the case, we're still going to calculate at a squared, which is a percentage of variation attributed to the treatment. And we should expect this value to be uh, relatively small because of the fact that we are failing to reject the null, that we don't see any treatment effect. Okay, our equation for at a squared is equal to the sum of squares between over SS total. You can take it from our source table from the previous page. Um, and those values are equal to 8 over 44. Just to show you where those values are coming from. Again, 8 SS between over SS total over 44. 8 over 44 gives us a proportion of 0.182. And we would say that 18% of the difference that we see is attributed to treatment. But again, there was no treatment effect. The numerator was no different than the denominator. So um, to conclude, we would indicate that we fail to reject the null. Results indicate that there are no significant differences among the three treatments. Treatments, levels, conditions, all can be used interchangeably. And we would cite our F, our degrees of freedom, 2 comma 9 was equal to 1.00. And then our eta squared statistic, which was equal to 0.182. And that would be our concluding statement, that for this particular example, we so see no treatment differences um, between the three different samples that we were testing. Number 11, use an ANOVA with alpha of 0.05 to determine whether there are any significant differences among the three treatment means. And note, because the samples are all the same size, MS within is the average of the three sample variances. We'll come back to that in a second. But for now, we'll begin with our research in null. Our null says, again, that population 1 will equal population 2, which will equal population 3. No differences um, in these three different populations or conditions. And the research hypothesis is going to state that at least one level or condition treatment is significantly different. We're going to uh, calculate our F ratio, which is um, MS between which represents treatment effects and random unsystematic variation over MS within, which represents random unsystematic differences or variations only. And we're going to begin with our MS between. 
In this case, we don't have um, access to the statistics that would make it easier to calculate SS total. Um, and so we'll have to use our SS between equation. So MS between is equal to SS between over its corresponding degrees of freedom. And our equation for SS between is as follows. So SS between is equal to the sum of our t values squared over n minus g squared over n. And we have our t values. We're going to do this process, the sum of t squared over n, for all three levels or conditions. So, um, and we know that g, we've learned this in the past, that g represents the sum of x across all conditions or can be understood as the sum of t. So t represents the sum of x for each sample and g represents the sum of x across all samples or conditions. So the sum of t, right, we're taking the sum of this group here. If we were to calculate 100 plus 50 excuse me, 50 plus 75 plus 100, we should get 225. And n, again, the, these weren't given, but we understand how to find them, is the sum of n. So we're just taking the sum of samples for all three conditions. So 25 plus 25 plus 25 gives us 75. And with that, we can replace um, values in start to solve for SS between. So SS between is equal to the sum, I'm going to put in parentheses, our first T is equal to 50. So 50 squared over N25 plus our second T, 75 squared over 25 plus our third T, 100 squared over 25 and then minus g, which we just figured out is 225. We're going to square that over n, which is 75. Now you can see why in the previous example I opted to calculate SS total instead of SS between. It's a lot more involved, but in this case, the data that was provided, we don't really have the option. So SS between so we'll do these separate fractions. Um, so if we square 50 and divide by 25, we get 100. And if we take 75, square it, and divide by 25, we get 225. And finally, 100 squared divided by 25, we get 400. And again, minus 225 squared over 75. And I'll continue over here. So the sum of 100 plus 225 plus 400 is equal to 725 minus 225 squared over 75. And so this should look very familiar. It's the, um, similar to the process of computing the SS, sum of squared deviations for x values. But now it's the representation um, of the entire data set across all three conditions. So in our calculators, 225 squared divided by 75 subtracted from 725. That gives us SS between equal to 50. Okay, so we're going to transfer that over in just a second. An additional um, value we should calculate now is the degrees of freedom between. And let's see if I can fit it in down here. So degrees of freedom between is equal to, our equation is k minus 1. k represents how many conditions or levels we have. We have 3. 3 minus 1 gives us 2. So we're going to transfer this into our table. So again, SS between is equal to 50. DF between is equal to 2. C 
So we know we've just cal calculated SS between is equal to 50. And DF between was equal to 2. Next, we're going to calculate um, MS within. Well, first, um, we, we can calculate right now MS between. And that's equal to SS between over its corresponding degrees of freedom. And that would be 50 over 2, and that gives us 25. So we know what MS between is equal to now. That's equal to 25. Now let's calculate our SS within. And that equation, SS um, within, we've learned, is the sum of SS values. And I'm going to take you back to the data. You may have it in front of you, but I'm going to um, evaluate what we were given. So in the previous example, we were given our SS values. In this example, in this example, we aren't given SS, we're given variance, our three variance values. So what we need to do is convert our variance into an SS value so that we can calculate the sum of SS across all conditions. So we learned in the previous chapter, or back in chapter four, variance is equal to SS over degrees of freedom. So if I want to solve for SS, SS would equal degrees of freedom multiplied by our variance. So we have variance and we have degrees of freedom for each sample. So our first sample, SS1, would equal variance 1 over, multiplied by degrees of freedom. So let's go back to see what those values are equal to. So for our first um, sample, variance is equal to 2.67 and degrees of freedom would equal 24. So our variance is equal to 2.67 multiplied by our degrees of freedom which is equal to 24. SS2, and I'll do the calculations in just a second, again variance multiplied by its corresponding degrees of freedom. And the last one, same equation. So we're taking what we have and converting to what is necessary for this equation for SS within. So we'll go back and, and get these values. So for our second sample, SS, or excuse me, variance is equal to 2. And the third one is equal to 1.33. And the degrees of freedom are going to be the same since n is equal um, to 25. So this would be 2 multiplied by degrees of freedom, 24. And the last one would be 1.33 multiplied by 24. Again, we were given variance, so um, we don't need to do anything else other than multiply by its corresponding degrees of freedom. So this product is equal to 64.08, 2 multiplied by 24, we get 48, and then 1.33 multiplied by 24, 31.92. And again, ultimately what we want is the sum of all sum of squared deviations for the three conditions. So if we take the summation here, sum of SS, we get 144. I'm just adding these values here. So SS, sum of SS across conditions is equal to 144. We can put that into our table and now calculate our SS or degrees of freedom for between. Degrees of freedom between, excuse me, within. is equal to n minus k. So our total number of observations or participants was the sum of n's across conditions and that was 75. And we had three treatment conditions, so that's equal to 3, and we get 72 for degrees of freedom within. Now we can calculate our um, ms, mean squares for within, um, for within which is 
ms within. Again, it's equal to its ss within over corresponding degrees of freedom within. We just calculated those values. And that's equal to 144 over 72. So in our, in our calculators, we enter 144, divide that by 72, and we get ms for within equal to 2. And now, even though we don't necessarily need them, um, the proper notation or table, output table for ANOVA requires the DF total and SS total. We will need our SS total to calculate at a squared. So this would be 194. Again, it's just the sum of our SS between added to SS within. S uh, degrees of freedom total would be the sum of DF between added to df within, and we get 74. So everything's been filled in, and now we can calculate our f ratio, which is equal to ms between over ms within. Again, we're just taking 25 divided by 2. 25 divided by 2 gives us 12.5. Once again, our F is calculated by MS between over MS within. We just calculated those. It's equal to taking these two, 25 over 2. Our F ratio is equal to 12.5. So 12.5. We would report it as F of degrees of freedom from the numerator to degrees of freedom for the denominator. 72 is equal to 12.5 and now we're required to um, find our critical F to draw our final conclusion. We're going to use our F distribution to find our critical F value. Again we're using the degrees of freedom for the numerator 2 and degrees of freedom for the denominator 72 to find this critical F value. So again, our numerator degrees of freedom was 2, denominator degrees of freedom 72. So we're going to enter here at 2 and go down to the closest thing that we have is 70 or 80. We're going to choose 70 because that's going to yield a higher um, critical F value and it's equal to 3.13. So our critical value is equal to 3.13. And I'm going to erase some of this information so I can make room for a visual representation of these two statistics. So given our positively skewed distrib F distribution, we have um, a critical, critical F of 3.13, and that sets or de defines the critical region. And we have a an uh, F statistic equal to f equal to 12.5 which would be way over here somewhere so visually we know we get to reject the null the null says that all those treatments were equal there was no treatment effect and now we've concluded that at least one of them is significantly different from the others and of course we would use a, a post test to determine exactly which one is significantly different but at this point we're just going to uh, reject the null and one more step includes computing our eta squared and drawing our final conclusion. Okay, so our eta squared is equal to SS between over the SS total. SS between for this example was equal to 50 SS total was equal to 194. 50 divided by 194 gives us 0.258. And we would conclude that 25.8% of the differences we see amongst the three conditions is due to treatment or due to treatment effects. 
So our concluding statement would read as, as follows. So we reject the known results indicate there are, excuse me, significant differences between the three treatment means. You could also write it as that there are significant differences between the three levels, three um, conditions. Uh, this is just another alternative three treatment means. In our F, we conduct an F test with degrees of freedom 2 comma 72 and our F was equal to 12.50 and our ETA squared was equal to 0.258 again indicating that 25.8% of the difference that we are detecting is due to treatment.